Well, we've already <coughs> read the text, so let's begin with a little bit of review. Now, last time we saw Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, how he went into James and, and to the elders and shared with them all that God had done through his ministry among the Gentiles, and how James and the elders all glorified the Lord and rejoiced in this gracious work. And I think sometimes we kind of miss the point of, uh, you know, the significance of that. You know, that they, these Jews, were thankful that he was reaching out in his mercy to these Gentiles, you know, to save those who not long before they had despised. Again, the gospel was bringing, you know, breaking down the barriers and bringing these two groups of people and making them into one. And it just reminds us of how the gospel can change our hearts and give us the power to love the unlovely, making us want to see them come to Christ. You know, again, sometimes we, we may not necessarily see anything in them that's lovely, and, uh, you know, but, but the fact that they're made in the image of God Okay, that, that gives them, of course, some measure of loveliness and the fact that Jesus calls us to do this and we love Him, that gives us also uh, more motivation and more affection. But even more so, we need to see that we are still connected, regardless of, of how distant we may be, we are connected and we're going to look at that a little bit more. Now, we also saw something that was weighing on James' heart how there were so many Jews who had believed, he said by this time, countless thousands, who were zealous for the law. You know, not, not the Ten Commandments, although I'm sure they were zealous for those, but I think he has in mind here the Mosaic law, the ceremonial law, circumcision, and the traditions. And they had heard that Paul was teaching the Jews among the Gentiles that he was evangelizing that they should turn away from these things. Now, last week we saw that it may seem strange that James would defend them, but we saw that under the new covenant that the Jews had the liberty in Christ to keep these traditions as long as they did not depend on them for their acceptance with God. You see, this was the pharisaical error, you know, legalism. I obey the Ten Commandments. I, I do what the ceremonial law commands me to do. I go through all the ceremonies and I'm right with God. No, that's, that's not what it's for. These things were meant to show them their sins and to point them to Jesus that they might trust in Him. They were never meant to be a substitute for Him. So as long as He didn't substitute these things for Christ, they could still observe these things. This was the culture they had grown up with. They didn't have to abandon it after coming to the reality. And so James counseled Paul to show the Jews that what they had heard about him was not true, that he should take four men under a Nazarite vow, purify himself, and go with them into the temple and pay for their expenses. Now, that, that was the interesting part, if the other part wasn't, to pay for the animal sacrifices that they would have to give at the conclusion of this particular vow. Now, again, this may seem even stranger to us that believing Jews were still offering sacrifices in the temple. But again, they could do this as long as they didn't look to these things to make them right with God. And Paul, notice, was willing to submit to this. This was not a compromise on his part, but he was doing this because, again, he wanted to minister to these Jews. Even though he understood he was no longer required to keep that law, he did it to become all things to all men, as he says, to win some to Christ, but also to build up those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, not to put a stumbling block in their way that doesn't need to be there. Now, we know where he stood with regard to the Judaizers and their belief that you had to do these things to be saved. Paul did not believe that. He was not condoning that. He was simply showing the Jews that it was still okay to hold to their traditions. Now, again, and again, he did that to minister to them. And in the same way, we need to use the liberty that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ to minister to others, to seek to accommodate ourselves as much as we possibly can without compromising, okay, to seek to win them to Jesus. Now, this morning, we see the outcome of James' proposal. Okay, Paul did what he said, but 
What happened was not what James was expecting, apparently. But Paul was. Remember, Paul was expecting to be arrested in Jerusalem. He was expecting to go eventually to Rome. So we see these things begin to unfold. Paul was attacked at the temple, as we've already read, saved by a Roman authority. And it led to an opportunity to testify to the Jews of the gospel of God's grace. And for Paul, that made all of this worth it because of his love for his people. Now, first we see him attacked at the temple. Again, Paul did as James suggested. He took the men into the temple. And when the seven days were completed that had to do with the vow and the purification that was necessary, certain Jews from Asia, and remember, Ephesus sometimes, I don't know why I forget, but perhaps we all do, that Ephesus is in Asia. These Jews were likely from Ephesus. Paul spent a great deal of time there. They were in Jerusalem for the feast, and they saw him in the temple. Immediately, they turned to trying to set the crowd against him by making false accusations. And it's interesting. It's the same thing that James had told Paul that... Uh, the Jews had heard, the believing Jews. Apparently, the unbelieving Jews heard this as well. In verse 28, this is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. Now, obviously, this is more than what James was talking about. This was the, the slander the Jews had made against Paul. Now, we've already seen that this was not true. Paul was, was in the temple to prove that he had not abandoned it or the law. And as to abandoning his own people, he was about to prove to them what he had written to the church at Rome on his third missionary journey was true, what we read in our meditation this morning, that he was willing to do anything that he possibly could to bring the Jews to faith in Christ, even to go as far as being willing to be accursed, separated from Christ, if it would turn his fellow countrymen to Jesus. Now, they also accused him of bringing Greeks into the temple. Uh, what I, perhaps, you know, we, we, well, we know that um, Greeks are just one of several types of Gentiles. And we know that Gentiles, if they were not full Jews, if they weren't fully converted to Judaism, were not allowed in the temple. God-fearers, those who had joined themselves to the worship of Israel's God, but did not receive circumcision and did not submit to the Mosaic traditions. They were called God-fearers. They could go as far as the court of the Gentiles, which was, if you look at a diagram of the temple and you see the wall of the temple, there's this inner court. And then the structure of the temple itself, the, the area outside on either side was called the court of the Gentiles. That's as far as they could go. But to go into the temple itself was forbidden, and they had assumed that Paul had brought some, perhaps God-fearers, certainly Greeks, into the temple because earlier they had seen him with Trophimus the Ephesian. Again, so they recognized this man who was from Ephesus, and these were Jews from Asia that likely had seen Paul in Ephesus, and now they want him arrested. So they trump up these charges. And the charges stuck. The mob listened. They took hold of him. They dragged him out of the temple. They began beating him. They were hoping to put him to death, to kill him, before the authorities could arrive. Now, Paul knew the risks of coming to the temple. But again, he was willing to do this because of his love for his people, for the believing Jews, to show them that he had not forsaken the traditions, for the Jews that he might bring the gospel to them because he was hoping and expecting that this would turn to a testimony to his Lord. Now, one other thing that gave Paul encouragement here, I think, was he also knew that the outcome of this situation was in the Lord's hands. And he knew that nothing could happen to him outside of his will. Okay? He knew that no one could take away his life before it was time. Now, I want us to notice here that when we are doing the Lord's will, even if we're doing it, you know, because we love the Lord and hopefully we're doing the things we do for that reason. And even if we're seeking to love those we minister to, it doesn't mean that we're not going to get hurt. Okay, we, we can get hurt. Paul was beaten many times during his missionary journeys. Paul was stoned perhaps to death on one occasion. 
doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer injury. That's why Jesus says we have to be willing to pick up our crosses to follow Him. We have to be willing to pay the ultimate price of dying for His glory if we are going to carry out His will. So it doesn't mean we're not going to get hurt, but it does mean that whatever the Lord allows, He is going to use to further His kingdom. I think the fact that we're willing to risk these things the fact that we're willing to endure whatever might come our way for sharing the gospel with others or doing what the Lord calls us to do and to do it patiently out of love is a witness that the Lord can use to affect the lives of others. I wonder how many people saw Paul, you know, just everything he was willing to endure for the Jewish people it certainly didn't affect all of them in a positive way. But there were those who believed, those whom the Lord was drawing out of Israel to bring into the fold, his witness was a very large part of this. So again, first we see what Paul was willing to endure to bring the gospel to others. Now secondly, we see his rescue by a Roman tribune. The report of this riot, uh, Luke tells us, soon reached the Roman commander, and, and basically tribune is another name for commander, who immediately came down with some soldiers and centurions and when the Jews saw them, they stopped beating Paul. And after the tribune had taken Paul into custody, he began asking the Jews, who is this man? What has he done? And obviously, you know, one, some people were saying one thing, some another, and when he couldn't get a clear answer, he ordered Paul to be taken to the barracks. Be but before they got there, Paul spoke with him. And when he heard him using the Greek language, he realized that he was not whom he, you know, supposed that he was, the Egyptian who some time ago had led a revolt. Now, we don't know anything about this from the Scriptures except from basically this comment. But Josephus does record something, and John Gill tells us about this event. He says this, Josephus speaks of one that came out of Egypt to Jerusalem and gave out that he was a prophet and deceived the people whom he persuaded to follow him to the Mount of Olives where they should see the walls of the city fall at his command, and so through the ruins of it they might enter into the city. But Felix, the Roman governor, fell upon them, killed 400, and took 200 prisoners, and the Egyptian fled. Okay, now this had happened three years before the event we're reading about right here. So Paul's not this Egyptian. You know, the funny thing is, when you, when you consider... Now, we were talking about this yesterday, weren't we? How um, people are so apt to follow, you know, people that have these bizarre ideas. You know, they, they can get gatherings of, of thousands of people so easily, and yet you share the truth with someone and they reject it. And the question is why they believe these ludicrous things and, and they don't believe something reasonable and, and truthful. Well, the answer is, of course, that Satan has them deceived. And he's going to work against them to, you know, not to believe the truth and to believe the lie so that he'll keep them basically in, in bondage. Now, we don't not share the truth for that reason, but we rely upon the Lord to open their eyes in order to bring them to faith in Christ. It's not just a matter of truth and reason. There is more behind it. Now, remember also what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse that we've been looking at in the evening. He said that within the time frame of this generation, to whom he was speaking, or a 40-year period, that many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Well, here's one example. And this is one of the signs that God's judgment on the Jewish nation was drawing near in 70 AD. No, Paul's not the Egyptian. Instead, he tells the tribune that he was a Jew, a citizen of Tarsus uh, of the Roman Empire. He also pled with him that he might speak to the people and before we move to what comes next, I just want again a note, I just want to note again Paul's love for his people. I mean, look at what they were just doing to him. They dragged him out of the temple, they were beating him, they were trying to kill him. And yet his desire was still to bring Christ to them, to preach the gospel to them, that they might embrace their Messiah. That that was his heart. Now, again, this is the extent to which we are to love our enemies. You know, even those who despitefully use us, who hate us, who have injured us, we should still seek to bring the gospel to them. And, 
And perhaps this helps us make sense of some of the things where people, you know, some missionaries on the field have had to watch perhaps their spouses, even their children, even their babies, tortured, you know, murdered, um, because they won't forsake Christ, they won't give Him up, they won't renounce Him. And how that witness often the Lord uses to bring people that would do such atrocious things, even them, to faith in Christ when they see the kind of love that they have for the Savior and the kind of love they have for them that they'd be willing to sacrifice that which is most dear to them for the sake of their salvation, for the sake of the gospel. And I want us to know, too, how it is that Paul was delivered from the mob. I mean, here's something else we should pay attention to through this Roman tribune. Now, we may not always agree with the policies of, of government, and certainly I know Paul didn't agree with, with Rome on everything. We don't agree with our government on everything. But we should be thankful that God has established government to do what they're supposed to do, and that is protect the innocent from unjust treatment. Thankfully, our government still does that to some degree, not always, sadly. That's why we need to pray for them. Now, finally, and most importantly, I want us to look at Paul's testimony to them. When the tribune gave Paul permission to speak, Paul motioned to the mob, you know, to get their attention. And Paul wanted to be careful how he approached this because this was, was really his, his one opportunity to speak to these Jews. And as the Jews in Jerusalem hated Jesus, I think more than all the other Jews throughout the, the Roman Empire, or at least in Palestine in Jesus' case and in Paul's case, this might be his only opportunity to speak to the Jews who hated him more than any other Jews in the empire. Now, since we've already dealt with the theology of this passage the first time we went through it, and Paul's going to relate this several more times, you know, to, to kings and governors and so forth, uh, let's instead, again, focus on how he approached them, okay, to show us how love accommodates the gospel message, you know, to the audience, to those we seek to introduce to the Lord Jesus Christ without compromise, okay? Now, he began by speaking to them in the Hebrew language, which was their native tongue, and this caused them even to quiet down more, okay? They, you know, communicating to others in a familiar language is one way to show respect. That's one of the reasons why missionaries learn the language, I think, perhaps even if they know English. There was a missionary friend, uh, acquaintance that, that we had uh, in our Calvary Chapel days, and we were going to college, who was ministering down in Tijuana, and he was speaking the language very fluently, at least from my perspective, because I didn't know Spanish. But from his perspective, he still had not mastered the art, so to speak, of speaking in the kind of in, with the kind of intimacy that one can speak in that language. It was very important to those to whom he ministered, not only that he spoke Spanish, but that he could communicate in a very intimate kind of way, to have a skillful use of the language. It, it made them pay attention. Otherwise, it offended them. And I think in this case, Paul was showing them that he too was a child of Abraham, that he was a Hebrew speaking their language. Secondly, he addressed them as brethren and fathers, not treating them as enemies, even though they were enemies of Christ and enemies of the gospel, but he was not treating them in that way. He was showing them that he was one of them, that they were brethren, and he was showing them further respect and honor. And again, we need to make sure that we treat those we witness to not as enemies, but as family. Do you realize that the whole human race is one giant family? Sometimes we forget. There's only one race, you know, and that's the human race. We are all brothers and sisters, so to speak, in Adam, okay? We all came from a common set of parents. We're all cousins, you know, many times removed, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, and all of us need, have the same need, the common need of a Savior. So we need to understand these are family and they are in need. Third, he identifies with them further in their particular views of, of how they're viewing him because he used to view uh, Christianity in the same way. He starts off by saying that he too was a Jew, and though he was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, which is basically north of Jerusalem between Antioch and Derbe, so Antioch in Syria and Derbe, which is where he went on his first missionary journey, he was brought up in Jerusalem, 
which is where he is. Jerusalem is important to the Jews, the center of Judaism. He was educated under Gamaliel, one of the celebrated rabbis of his day, one of the great teachers of Israel. And strictly according to the law of their fathers, again, something very important to them, that he too was zealous for God and zealous for the law, he says, just as you all are today. Now again, identifying with him, I was in your shoes, okay? I saw things the way you saw them. And as a matter of fact, he says, I also persecuted those who were according to this way in the same way you did. You know, the way is how the early Christians were known. Paul would take those belonging to the way, he would arrest them, he would imprison them. And he says, if you don't believe me, just talk to the high priests and the elders. They know that I went to them to get papers that I needed, even to go to Damascus to find everyone who belonged to the way there, that they might bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. Now again, he was relating to them. He was saying, I was standing where you were standing, and I think we can do the same thing when we are relating to our audience. We used to be of the world. We used to think the way the world thinks, you know, that the world is all there is. And the thing that's most important in life is to try to get as much of it as you can, enjoy it as much as you can, because once you're dead, that, that's pretty much it. Now, people also have some idea of, you know, okay, I used to believe that God would weigh my works, my good works versus my bad works, and my good works were going to come out ahead, and God was going to let me into heaven. I was surprised R.C. was talking about in the series on apologetics how few people there are that really are atheists. You know, only a couple percent, perhaps, of the whole Western world. But that doesn't mean that the people who believe that God exists have a right view of God. But again, we had a wrong view of him as well. We can relate to them. And I think we should try to do that. But Paul then, having identified with them, goes on to tell them how all of this changed, how the Lord changed his life, gives him his testimony. As he was approaching Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. You know, at noonday, when the sun was at its brightest, a light brighter than the sun flashed from heaven, knocked him off his horse, he fell to the ground, he heard someone saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When he asked who he was, the voice replied, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. You know, by persecuting his people, he was persecuting Christ. Now, Paul knew that his testimony alone would not be received by them, so he calls in the witnesses that were there. From the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact will be confirmed. There were those who were with him who saw the same thing, who accompanied him from Jerusalem to Damascus. They saw the light, so to speak. They heard the sound of the voice, even though they did not understand what he was saying. So Paul here is, is drawing the evidence, the proof that this event actually took place. Now, we may not be able to draw upon the same kind of supernatural phenomenon to prove, you know, that there was something that happened in our lives, but we can to the change that took place in our lives once we came to Christ because we became different people. And that's what Paul goes on to do, to show how his life was radically changed. He immediately asked Jesus, what shall I do, Lord? And Jesus told him to go into the city and there he would show him. At this point, Paul was blind. And so he had to be led. And again, there were witnesses to the fact that he was blind. And once there, Ananias, and notice he points out he's a Jew as well, a very devout Jew by the standard of the law. This is somebody I think you all would appreciate. Well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. He came to me and said, Brother Saul, so here's another devout Jew, who recognized Jesus as the Messiah and came to him, he said, receive your sight, and immediately Paul could see. Why does he relate this? It's part of his testimony. A miracle took place. Paul was blind, but then he was able to see further proof that these things actually took place, and he had witnesses. Ananias went on to explain why the Lord revealed himself to him, because he had chosen him to be a witness of all that he had seen and heard. He was to be a witness of the resurrected Christ. He was called to be an apostle. And that's what Paul was doing here. 
on this particular occasion, fulfilling the calling that Jesus had given to him, telling these Jews what he had seen and what he had heard, that he had seen the risen Messiah, that God had fulfilled his promise to the Jews, to the fathers, by sending them first the Messiah. Now again, that's really all that God expects us to do, all that our Lord Jesus expects us to do in our bearing witness to him, to tell others who he is, what it is he's done for us, how he can do the same thing for them, but also to back it up with this kind of life, okay, this life that actually cares about these people. Unless we care for them, we're not really going to try uh, to reach them. Now, Ananias also told Paul that he should be baptized. That was a part of Paul's testimony, that he should receive the mark of the new covenant, which is that sign or symbol of the washing of sin, a way of sin that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the washing of regeneration. Why did Paul add that? Well, it happened. But perhaps it was because he wanted to help them understand why believing Jews who had already been circumcised were being baptized when they came to the Lord Jesus Christ because it is a sign of the washing away of their sins through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's something that they needed and they'd only find it through the Lord Jesus. Well, Paul then goes on to tell them one last thing that Jesus said to him, and it was really the thing that ended up provoking them. Um, but he said it anyway because he knew what the outcome was supposed to be and, and it was a part of his testimony. Three years later, he says, well, he doesn't tell us three years later, but this is, it took place three years later. When he returned to Jerusalem, he went to the temple. And again, I want you to notice that Paul keeps bringing the temple in. He wants them to know he hasn't abandoned the temple, showing that he still considered it a part of the Jewish heritage and a place where God could be worshipped. But while he was there, he fell into a trance. He saw a vision in which Jesus told him at that time he should get up, get out of Jerusalem because they weren't going to believe his testimony. They were not going to believe him. They were not going to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul responds by telling Jesus, why wouldn't they believe? They should believe. Because, I mean, look at what's happened to me. Look at the change that's taken place in my life. They know that I, I used to persecute everyone who believed in this way. They, they know that I had letters to Damascus to try to imprison those. They, they know I tried to destroy the church. But they know also that now I'm trying to do everything I can to build up that church and making even the greatest sacrifices. But Jesus said they would not believe and that he should leave because he was sending him to the Gentiles. Now, next week, we're going to see the reaction. We're going to see that what Jesus said was true. They didn't believe him. Even though he had all this compelling proof, you know, and the fact that Jesus even told him in advance how they would respond, of course, is even further evidence. Now, again, why wouldn't somebody believe if they have all this evidence? I mean, the Jews had everything they needed. They had the testimony of Scripture. They had the testimony of Paul's changed life. They had these miracles and the people who saw these miracles. Well, what is it, what is it that's going on? Well, it reminds us again that even though we may have irrefutable evidence to the truth of Christianity, not only to the existence of God, and by the way, I do believe that R.C.'s argument for the existence of God is conclusive. It may be, you know, maybe needs to be related in, in different ways to different people, but I, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, and certainly God tells us in His Word this is true, the evidence that He gives to us from the creation is irrefutable, that He exists. And even though He's given us, I believe, irrefutable evidence that the Bible is His Word, even if this truth has transformed our lives in a way that other people can see it and they cannot deny that our lives have been changed, even if we can bring all these things to them, no one is going to believe. No one is going to embrace Jesus unless he actually changes their hearts. Let's not forget, you know, um, what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. He was there intent on one purpose, to imprison Christians that he might bring them back to Jerusalem they might be found guilty and they might be put to death. 
Nobody even showed up to evangelize him, right? I mean, it's not like he had all the, well, let's just say, the Lord suddenly intervened and changed his heart right on the spot. And we often think that it was because he saw a miracle, you know, Jesus appearing to him. That's not what changed his heart, was it? Because Jews, the Jews who lived during the time of Jesus saw all these wonderful miracles that they could not deny, even the dead being raised to life, and they still hated Jesus and they still didn't believe. Something more went on in Paul's heart than the fact that he simply saw a miracle. The Lord changed him. So unless the Lord does for the people that we are ministering to, unless he does for them what he did for Paul on the road to Damascus, they're not going to change. He has to open their eyes. He has to open their ears. He has to change their hearts. So the bottom line that I want us to see this morning is this. We need to love others okay, and share the gospel with them. We need to give them reasons for faith. We need to give them arguments. We need to give them proof for the truth of Christianity because people believe a lot of weird things. They've heard a lot of weird things. They have a lot of objections. We need to answer those objections. We need to give them again this, this evidence. We need to show them what the gospel can do, what it has done to change our lives. But we also need to remember that salvation ultimately comes from above. Let's not forget. We need to pray and remember that the Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Well, may the Lord encourage us through these things this morning um, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be equipped in every way particularly to love others, but also, again, to look to Jesus, knowing the outcome is ultimately in his hands. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?